Good morning. Welcome to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's Connected Systems Institute lecture series. My name is Charles Mosley and I'll be your host for today's lecture, Measurement Data Big and Small, How It Matters, presented here today by Kevin Clark. Uh, Kevin Clark joined Fluke in 2016 and is currently Vice President of Fluke Reliability. Prior to joining Fluke, Kevin led the Asset Management Division of Perficient as the Senior Director. He has 30 plus years of industrial experience working with both Fortune 500 and smaller startup manufacturing and technology companies, serving in various leadership capacities. Before we begin, some housekeeping. Please mute your microphones and enter questions into the Q&A box. We will take questions at the end of Kevin's presentation. Kevin, take it away. Thanks, Charles. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yes. OK, great. So good morning, everyone. Um, it's good to be here. We're uh, generally uh, doing this um, now from a virtual standpoint. And, and uh, here we are at all of our homes uh, presenting this. And first thing I want to do is I want to lighten up the load just a little bit. I know we're presenting uh, on behalf of University of Wisconsin Connected Systems, but uh, the term lecture never never did well for me in the first place. So I'd rather turn it to more of a sharing my perspective of uh, big and small data. That way we can we can look at this as more of a conversation rather than black and white for data because we all know uh, depending on where you are, who you are, what applications you're applying, data changes. So what I want to do a little bit here is just introduce myself so that um, um, so that we can at least uh, start with a context and a perspective of who I am. And Charles mentioned that I've been in this business for a long time. I've been with Fluke for uh, going on four years now and um, working mostly on the strategy side and developing uh, the business uh, applications, developing uh, the connections and, and developing partnerships with, with organizations. And, and how we do business and what are the big needs in the business and of course that all has to do with uh, go to market and um, developing of new products. I spent a decade um, as a maintenance and operations technician um, so I, I lived in the I, I lived in that space of repairing and replacing pumps and motors and um, and so I, I come out of the field and I what I did was I went back to college to um, uh, to get myself out of maintenance and of course that didn't work well. Um, already greener so anyway um, long time standing member of SMRP Society of Maintenance and Reliability Professionals and and uh, and I continue to be very active with them and I've been a CMRP since uh, 2004 um, and so that's that's been a, a real boon to to the uh, success in my career is was working with that organization. And I think that the thing I wanted to, wanted to say too, and I think that helps in this conversation with big and small data, is that one of the favorite one of the things that I consider my favorite pastime is is to think about things that we can't do. Um, and that that list of things that we can't do gets smaller and smaller all the time and you have to think further and further um, trying to understand what are those things that we can't do and so anyway I think as you see what we talk about through this uh, big data small data you'll see that um, um, there are a lot of things that we can do um, matter of fact because of the cultural shifts and the, the rapid uh, uh, technological adoption that we've seen over the last 60 days um, really feeds that um, and what can we do and I, I think we're figuring out we can do a lot of stuff. So how many of you um, have been on one of these today, one of these uh, virtual meetings? I've already been on a couple of them this morning. I've um, got more scheduled for um, more scheduled for today. You know, the the the, uh, the interesting thing I think is that I would have been two months ago, I would have been one of the last people to turn my video on, um, not because I'm shy. I think everybody would would uh, know that that's not the case, but um, I just I just wasn't big on the technology. 
Um, but when they took away my ability to get out of the home office and go see people and interact with people and all of a sudden um, getting on a video chat felt okay. Um, and so we've just been growing towards it, growing towards it, growing towards it. And, and I'm, I'm all talking within the context of 60 days. And so doing things like this is starting to feel a little bit more normal, but it's also opening our eyes to uh, the technology that's available that some of us just kind of were lukewarm to. And so now it's become part of our everyday life. And, and uh, you know, so you see pictures like this on the Internet all the time of, of teams coming together and and uh, communicating and working together in a completely different way. And I think all of us can even say that we've probably done this with our family at least once. And uh, that's getting to be a bit normal too. And and uh, so big changes. So um, this, this, uh, this you might find interesting. Um, I've used it a few times and it was a survey that was done last year by MIT. Um, there's a lot of green on here, but there's even more orange. Um, and orange means that we're in the bottom five. And, and so the question is, before we get into data, if it's from a digital standpoint, you know, how are you doing? And when you look at when you look at the data um, of how am I doing digitally, um, we think we're doing OK until you look at a survey like this that says uh, manufacturing is in the bottom five. Um, the public sector is in the bottom five. Construction and real estate is the bottom five. Um, some of the things you would expect to be in the top five um, are there, um, like entertainment and professional services and IT and technology. Um, but I think this is eye opening for us to really help us understand that there are so many industries that have lagged when it comes to technology, and some of them are feeling that in this last 30 to 60 days. Um, you know, and a question for you would be, um, you know, which sea level um, was actually your driving factor for digital transformation? And some people might say the CEO, uh, some might say the CTO, some might say the CIO, um, and then some of us might say COVID uh, drove our digital transformation. And I think, you know, to, as as I engage with some of our clients and colleagues and that I think COVID is is might be leading the pack on on driving digital transformation in the last 30 to 60 days and and um, I think some that were questionable of being digitally transformed in February can say transformed in May and so pretty miraculous stuff going on. This slide might throw you off a little bit. Um, so is there such a thing as a BS in intelligent manufacturing? To my knowledge, no. Um, so this is a Bachelor of Science, not what you think BS might mean. But um, I thought it would be interesting to at least present it to you and let you know what else is going on behind the scenes. And this was starting at the end of last year. So this isn't something that was driven by COVID, but it was driven by the fact that so many of the things going on um, and you can see the list there with additive manufacturing. And I mean, that's a hot, hot topic. Simulation, Internet of Things, AI and big data, what we're talking about today, cloud and mobile computing, augmented reality, you know, systems integration, supply chain, autonomous systems. Yeah, think about supply chain. What's going on with supply chain? Talk about turning an industry upside down and just exploding it out onto the market. I don't think I've been to the store and quite some time and practically everything comes to my front door. That's new. Um, and then cybersecurity. The reason I bring this up is I'm on a I'm on an advisory board and helping to develop this together with Microsoft and Rockwell and some others. Um, and to developing this bachelor of science degree at one or the other, and I'll I'll not mention it, one of the other Big Ten universities. Um, and so if I was to go back and, and do it over again, I did my undergrad in computer integrated manufacturing, so very similar, some some interesting stuff here or interesting correlations to to what's in this program. But if I was to do it over again, this is the one I would do. It's just um, it's hitting so many uh, big bullet points for what's going on in the world today. 
So let's dig in a little bit here. Um, so when Mary and I first talked about this and, and what we would present, we wanted to keep it in the context of what we do at Fluke um, and, the, and what we see in industry and, and the challenges that we see. Um, and we talked about big data and small data, and there's a lot of aspects to big data and small data, but it's difficult to have the conversation about big data and small data until you talk about data quality. Um, and I can tell you, I've been I've been on the end of the um, of the question where somebody said, so if I have data quality issues and I need to clean it up, what do I do? And I've had lots of conversations and been involved in lots of data cleanup activities. The one thing that that I don't see enough of is what's called data sustainability, and that's that's sustaining that data um, at the same level that you expect over and over and over again. Um, and when when we do that, it's not different than asset sustainability and, and keeping that asset up at an, an expected performance. So uh, data sustainability is very similar. So if I go through the effort of cleaning up data for um, for let's say a client or a colleague or something like that, if there's nothing to sustain the quality of that data, they'll be calling me again in a few years and saying, hey, so we still got the same problem. We need to go through that effort again. And you see that same methodology going on in a maintenance organization where they'll go out and they'll, they'll um, go and update a piece of equipment, clean it all up, make it look brand new again in a couple of years, it's right back where it was again, then they got to go through the effort. So, um, and what you'll also see is if you're not sustaining that data in a way that um, meets a performance measure, then you're going to see deterioration in the results over time and the data becomes less and less valuable to you. So generally the quality, uh, uh, data quality is defined by um, the fit for intended use. So fit for intended use of that asset, fit for intended use of that process, fit for intended use of that system. Um, and so if that data lines up with what your expectations are and you're collecting data, um, valuable data for that, then it's fit for its intended use. Big data, on the other hand, is that's one of those one of those terms. I think I think you're going to find as we go through this this um, this talk that that big data could have just as easily have been named infinite data, um, which means I can look at all data. Size really doesn't matter to me. Um, matter of fact, big data can also be small sets of data that's treated in a big data way. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Small data, on the other hand, um, and, and I, to be perfectly honest with you guys, I've, I've been dealing with data for my entire career, um, whether it's at the lowest level, right on the plant floor, data in an Excel spreadsheet, data that we write down, um, data that we use in dashboards. And, you know, that I never really considered that small data. Um, I was, even in the late 90s and early 2000s, I was developing SCADA systems. Um, and I never really thought about that as big data, small data. It was just, as far as I was concerned, it was data. And, and sometimes it was difficult to get to. Sometimes it was in a silo someplace. And, um, and then we had to work harder to, to get it out of that silo. Um, but when you read the definition of small data, it says data that is small enough for human comprehension. So small data has a lot to do with people. Um, and it's, it can look like big data, um, but really what it is, is it's, it's data that's focused on an asset. And we'll get into this a little bit more as we as we go through the the talk. But but um, small data small data is is not what I originally thought it was. And so over the years, I've I've formed some different opinions about small data and and how valuable it is for um, what we do every day. So first thing I want to talk about is of course the data quality. Um, 
And I can't emphasize enough how important it is to build a data strategy. Um, and I know that's difficult, um, especially if you're working from, let's say, an operations standpoint. What is my what is my uh, data strategy? Um, but what it boils down to is is the data you need. What do you require, right? And and one of the best ways to do that is go figure out what are my drivers for the business, and then from those drivers of the business, you know the things that that are key performance indicators in that. Um, and then you can start whittling that back down to what data can I connect, collect and put in a place that can be um, analyzed, can be even be taken to the level of big data, just depends on, on what the KPI is demanding. Um, and then is that KPI enough? Do we need the insights? Do we need the actionable uh, data? Um, and then the other thing about developing a data strategy is starting to develop standards or norms or value lists or naming conventions so that you know um, you don't call a bearing two different things or three different things or four different things or sometimes multiple um, names for a single bearing um, so starting to to get that that naming convention and value list down to a place where where it just um, is standardized within your organization. Um, and then also the types of assets and the types of systems and the types of um, sensors and um, whatever's creating data, we need to start to standardize the way we um, the way we refer to them. And then another big part of data strategy is a continuous improvement process. So data isn't always static so we always need to continue to look at that am i collecting it the best way is it accurate enough for what i need to do um, so those continuous improvement process become really important as well um, and then and, and I, of course i put the cartoons on the side just to kind of help that along and the top one just really hits me I, I found that a few years ago it's been one of my favorites right so you know when we when we report data yeah of course it's correct um, but Maybe it's not. Um, we know that, and it's not that it's not just correct, it's that the data might be skewed and we know that and we adjust for that, knowing that the data is slightly skewed or or may not be as good as we would like it to be, but we can't get the capital investment to go get it the right way. So the data isn't that great, but we treat it like it's great. Um, and then the next one is just really focusing on our critical assets, right? And so, not only are our assets critical, but our processes are highly critical and how we handle those processes. So data is created by process as well. And so we need to make sure that that data aligns with, with the processes. Um, and then establishing what is a good record. And every organization might be different, right? So your level of quality may be different than what they expect in in let's say an FDA regulated or a nuclear plant or you know um, an organization building airplanes and so what is a good record um, really needs to be fine defined by your organization and I put that last tidbit of information in there that 84 percent of CEOs are concerned about the quality of data they've been basing decisions on that's 84 percent that's not 16%. That's the, only the 16 are, is percent is not concerned about uh, data that they're basing their decisions on. So this is a massive concern for data quality. Um, so it's difficult to even have the conversation about small data and big data until we get some grip on our quality of our data. So what is big data? Um, you know, it's uh when it, when big data first came out what was it maybe a decade ago when we first started using the term big data um it uh it's it's got a funny connotation about it but when you really dig into it it's not talking about you and i it's talking about the systems it's talking about the machines it's talking about the computer that you're looking at right now uh to see this uh the, see this talk um it's it wants data and it wants an unbelievable amount of data. Um, 
So it's hard to draw the line between small data and big data if you only say it's about the how much data it is. It's really not. It's about finding correlations for big data. And so big data doesn't care about all the small um, individual machines. It really doesn't care much about that. What, what big data cares about is being able to associate the data coming off that asset to the uh, building information management systems that says the temperature is this or the outside temperature is that um, or that the HVAC had broken down during the time when that particular asset was failing. Big data makes correlations. It looks at what else is happening when that particular asset failed. And so it brings sets of data together. And matter of fact, when you look at those sets of data, they may uh, from from our human perspective, they may not make sense to one another. Why would you compare this data to that data? But when you put them together, all of a sudden it tells you something that you really didn't expect that you may not have thought about. Um, I had an example at Caterpillar many, many moons ago that um, we had a problem with, um, we would have a, an engine block that would, we had 1600 holes that needed to be machined on that engine block. and. And for some odd reason, it would just the whole engine block would be off, even though we had everything set exactly right. Couldn't figure it out, couldn't figure it out. And but the problem wasn't that that it was that difficult of a problem. The problem was that we couldn't correlate all the data because what the end problem was is that we were bringing once in a once in a blue moon, mm -hmm. we would leave that door open, the big door and it would be sub-zero temperatures um, and it would blast the block that was sitting right by that open door and then we take that block we put it on the on the machine and all the all the holes were in the wrong places but we couldn't correlate all the data and have that understanding um, because it was just there's just too much to analyze had we had big data and all those things associated it would have said hey dummy Every time you grab that cold block, you um, are going to have holes or out of tolerance. Let it get back down to room temperature. So um, I met Kevin Ashton a couple of years ago at one of the conferences, and I, I had a chance to talk to him for a few minutes, not very long. Interesting guy, very humble guy, um, almost to the point where he um, doesn't want to take credit for you know, the fact that he was the one that first coined the phrase, I think it was 98. He first coined the phrase Internet of Things, and he really didn't mean to. He just kind of said a statement. So if you see the statement at the end, uh, he said, if we had computers that knew everything there was to know about things using data they gathered without any help from us, we would be able to track and count everything and greatly reduce waste. It was a great big, huge, bold statement, right? But not earth shattering, just um, it was one of those things. It's like, huh, it's interesting. And of course, if it was me and I said the exact same thing that he said, um, we all have kind of different ways of saying it. If, if it had been me, this would have been the internet of stuff. I would have said, use the word stuff rather than things. And somebody else might have used something else. But the internet of things stuck. Um, and it just kind of resonated with with um, the global community that we have lots of things um, that need to be connected, that are creating data, that are giving us enough data that we can go correlate and create insights into things that we never really were able to do. So the the Internet of Things is is a big deal for for big data because we're bringing devices from around the world you know some of these some of these estimates are saying we'll have t more than 20 billion devices on the internet of things and and you know maybe that's a small number maybe that's a big number it's, it's hard to tell right now i think with this covid thing that might be a more achievable number than than maybe some of us thought but uh, um but the internet of things is a big deal for for big data So when you when you look at it, when you look at things like this, right? And this is a little bias, of course. It's fluke tools, and and so we're looking at sensors. Um, so we got a flow rate sensor, we got a 
fluke 3561 the, the question might be and 3561 by the way is a is a vibration sensor um and the question might be wow this is big data because we're looking at multiple sensors well if you go by definition um it's questionable so big data likes to look at lots of things not just a couple of inputs but lots of things and typically likes to look at sets of data and then be able to analyze sets of data so when you look at a couple of them it's questionable whether looking at two sensors is big data um, what you would more likely see is something to the right there where it's more of a dashboard and it's looking at lots of things but it just might be for one asset so does it really fit into big data and so that's why i kind of put this out here is is to help you reconsider what big data really is because these two examples um, may or may not be big data it depends on what else you're correlating it with and you see the other little cloud above once you get to the point of big data that's when things like predictive analytics and and artificial intelligence and machine learning and all of that start to come in because that's really what the tools are that we use for for big data sets So this is where I really wanted to get to because we talked a little bit about data quality. We talked a little bit about big data, but the next topic is small data. Um, this one's near and dear. It really is because this is what, as maintenance professionals, we spend a lot of time working with small data. And, and the reason we do that is because the small data is more about the people. It's more about what we do um so it might be something like us going out to a machine and observing um a failure and then we go to the next level and we write that down or we put it into our cmms or eam um and those are things that we can do that's data that we can create that's data particular to an asset um so it's it's within the context of a data set um and so small data is really few pieces of data but don't don't confuse that with the fact that we can have even more pieces of data and it stays in the small data context just because it's something that that human can consume so we can look at 10 pieces of data and make some analysis um, and know enough about the problem to go solve it small data is also finite so i think it, i said earlier that we could almost call it infinite data for big data just like we could call small data finite data All right so there is a limitation we small data is more about what we can consume as people <clears throat> and just like big data um, is about correlation small data is about causation so getting to the root of it so I'm going to say a couple of things that are going to confuse you even more, but I think you'll start to you'll start to see it as we go. Um, so small data is um, what we can used to consider data. Um, so it lives in small places like a silo. It lives, you know, associated directly to an asset. It is it lives <clears throat> maybe in a dashboard. We're starting to bring some things together where we can see it visually. Make some assessments on that data um, but it's it's very prescribed it's very to the point um, but look at it this way too and this is a this is the last point to is often derived from big data as meaningful insights so small data it can be the result of big data so if you're if you're within a CMMS or an EAM and you've received um, a go do a PM or go do a work order on such and such asset and it was automatically generated because of big data looking at trends and saying we're approaching a failure on this asset and it's going to be that bearing and a work order was automatically generated for that particular asset that work order is the result of <clears throat> correlation by big data, but the work order itself is small data. 
And so it gets a bit confusing, but when you start breaking it down like that, this this is data that is specifically and actions and our insights and actions that are directly associated to that asset. And so what we do as people, um, we understand that work order. We understand why um, we're going to do that, why we're going to go replace that bearing on that particular asset. Um, but there was a lot of work being done by big data and AI and correlating um, all these variables. And variables could be sensor data. It could be performance of the asset. It could be how long it's been. It could be based off the history of that asset and the things that we've seen before from bearing failure. So lots and lots of things that we wouldn't necessarily be able to quant quantify um, as human beings. So from a small data standpoint, the, in the left-hand corner, um, that's what we call a criticality assessment. And I don't, I don't know how many of you are going to be familiar with the criticality assessment. The criticality assessments, <clears throat> that's, that's great data. That's incredible data to really understand your asset, where it falls in the criticality, but it's 100% created by people. Um, there's no automated data collection for a criticality assessment. That's small data. Right next to it behind is called a FAMICA, Failure Modes, Effects, and Criticality Analysis. And it's all about you know finding the effects of, of failure, the, the occurrence, the severity, the design out methods that we'll use for maintenance. And, and that, that is incredible data as well. It's, it's more like infrastructure data and says, here's all my potential failures and here's how I'm going to address them. All 100% created by people. And so it's small data. You might have thousands of lines of potential failures, but it's small data. That data can then be used by big data um, and analyzed and correlating between maybe the criticality of that particular asset, then all the probability of failures of that particular asset, looking at all that data, and then maybe looking at real-time data, sensor technology and, and uh, um, the automation that we have on the plant floor and and maybe even some data coming in from the financial systems and what are we buying for this asset? What are we replacing on this asset? And that's what big data likes to, to correlate. But a lot of the really good stuff comes from small data. And then you also have a couple of other things here that, that fall into small data, and that is a work order on the left hand side, in the front and the left hand side. Um, and that that is just a work order that is generally filled out by uh, a technician and a technician will go complete the work. They'll put their own notes in there. They'll complete time. They'll complete a lot of other things. That's all small data. And then when you look at the other one, <clears throat> it looks like big data, but it's really small data. It's just presenting data in a very visual, <clears throat> visual manner. And some insights can be gathered from dashboards. No doubt about it. We've done it for decades where we've we've gotten as many as, uh, insights as we can from dashboards that really tells us the here and now. It doesn't tell us a lot about the future. It might tell us where we're trending, but it won't give us the types of insights and, and uh, actionable data that we need. And here at Fluke, we look at things a little differently. Um, so this is called uh, the four dimensions of reliability and success, and this is ours. So this is, this is not something that um, <clears throat> that we've pulled off for industry best practice. We look at things a little different. Since we look at things from a technician standpoint, our whole company is built around making the technician have a richer environment um, at the point of work. So we work on mobilizing those technicians and getting them out there and have as much data, if not all data, available to them at the work site. So we look at it a little differently. A lot of companies would say data should be first, right? Um, and sometimes you'll see that data first, then knowledge, then insights, then actions. But in our perspective, we're really trying to recreate what knowledge technicians already have. So if you've heard of tribal knowledge, that knowledge, we are, we are slowly but surely starting to build tribal knowledge into systems. Um, capturing the type of data that that a technician would capture by visually or by feel or by smell because in a lot of cases that's what technicians do they walk up to 
a, an asset and they say, I smell something that's recognizable, um, something's burning, and they can put their hand on the side of the asset and about where the heat is, um, they can say, yep, yeah, it's that bearing. Um, and they can also hear things and they say, yeah, that's generally what it sounds like when the bearing is failing. Those are all sense, uh, senses from a human being that we're trying to recreate and create data into systems that recreates that tribal knowledge. So we're after knowledge first and then capturing that data that makes sense to that knowledge and then taking it to the big data level and creating insights and, and actions. So we're going to start to uh, finish up here a little bit. Um, try not to uh, make this into too much of a lecture. I just want to introduce you guys to my perspective of, of uh, data and how it differs from big and small. And so um, this is a diagram that we like to, to show and it helps not only us, but it helps our clients to really kind of see how data is connected, how systems are connected and then how teams are connected and teams being us as people and um, and how we were able to, to capture data. So when you look at these, it's really kind of difficult just by looking at this and trying to figure out what's big data, what's small data. And so again, what I'll do here is I'll show you my perspective. And so take it for what it's worth, but my perspective, Fluke's perspective on how we look at this. So if you, if you look at what we've done here, we've gone through and labeled some of these. And so maybe it helps to show the um, the way this breaks down. So if you look at thermal imaging, alignment, vibration, SCADA systems, uh, electrical lubrication, and you know three three phase monitoring, for example. I mean, there's there's literally hundreds of ways you can uh, put sensor technology or or do some kind of measurement on the left hand side. Um, they're all small data. Every single one of those are small data. And you might even ask, wait, how can SCADA data be small data? Because it's huge. Sometimes you can have millions and millions and millions of, of uh, lines of data inside of a SCADA system. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But the problem is, is that, that it's every piece of data is associated to an asset. So until we get to the point that we're correlating data, that we're making comparisons of one to the next, to the next, to the next, and then we're building insights based off of all of those sensors, it doesn't rise to the level of big data until you do that. So it starts, literally starts as small data. So the transition to big data has a lot to do with what you're doing with the data, and that correlation is key. Even on the right hand side, you see that systems like work order management, inventory management, workflows, um, asset management, all of that remains small data until we start doing correlations. And you'll see in the middle, we've got knowledge, and that's what I was talking about earlier that we really want to go after and just understanding how do we continue to build the knowledge in our technicians without creating isolation. Um, I remember um, my first job with Johnson & Johnson, they hired me because they were afraid of the one guy that knew the SCADA systems inside and out would get hit by a truck. And he held all the knowledge to how they developed and what they did and, and why one sensor was developed the way it was versus another one. So what they felt like they needed to do is get a new guy in there to, to so they have two of us that have tribal knowledge, which was dangerous because we could both be out to lunch and both of us get by a truck. So what we're trying to create as, as Fluke is to be able to put that tribal knowledge into systems. And then there's a level of, of learning and dependency in that and a, a codependency, I suppose, between the technician and the systems and starting to build tribal knowledge in places where it's safe so that we can continue to have the tribal knowledge when somebody retires, um, when they move on to a new job. Um, that tribal knowledge still exists and we can move that then into the next person. And so that that knowledge 
still remains knowledge as small data until we get to the point where we can take all that data from left, from right, from center, and move it into a place above um, in that cloud. And so just so you're not hearing me for what I'm not saying, um, I'm not saying that big data is only in the cloud. That's, that's an untrue statement. Um, but an awful lot of big data is in the cloud. Um, but big data can also be an on-premise or on any system um, rather than just being on the cloud. But the point is, is that that it doesn't become big data until it gets to the point of being correlated. And then remember that once we've correlated that data and we get that directly back to the technician, that data, that result, that action or insight can then turn into small data for that technician to go do what they normally do. To summarize, um, strategy, it's gotta be first. It's gotta be the first thing on your mind to go figure out what are the, what are the insights that I need to perform? What are the goals and objectives, the things that, that drive my business, that, that show that I as a maintenance technician, I as a maintenance department, I as an operations group, I as this site, um, use as performance measures and then go back and figure out the data that will get me there. So strategy for your data is number one in understanding your data. Um, it's not even ahead of getting your data cleaned up. I'm, I'm sorry, getting your data cleaned up is not ahead of strategy. Strategy really ought to come before you go clean up that data um, because we don't want to continue to collect data we don't need. And we do want to collect it in a way that that is uh, valuable for um, our success. And small data is what we've always known as data. Um, so I think that's an important point that um, all data is small data in the beginning. And it transforms into big data as we create data sets and and data from all different directions and. I've, I've always been amazed. Um, I was at a university um, end of last year, and that university had said that um, they had never correlated the outside temperature of a facility with the data they were collecting inside the facility um, for HVAC systems. And they were amazed at the insights that they got just by adding that one extra variable and then correlating outside temperature with their inside HVAC systems. Um, it was a it was a learning moment for them. So small data focus on on that and, and start there. Uh, importance of data quality cannot be emphasized enough. Um, Accuracy is incredibly important and fit for use. And the one thing that I, I would also say is the more you work on fit for use, the clearer it comes, the clearer it becomes. Because the, the challenge isn't, isn't the data itself. The challenge is, do I really need that data? Well, it, and if I do collect that data, am I doing the right stuff with that data? Um, and then big data, of course, is the foundation of insights and actions, right? So big data only exists because of small data. And then the correlation, so real AI insights and actions exist because of big data uh, and the correlation that we can make. And, and uh, you know, I hate to say it, um, but big data, or let's say data in general, um, comes with no um subjectivity the only subjectivity it might come with is what we give it um but humans come with tons of subjectivity all right so when when we had a failure we looked at that failure maybe we were having a bad day maybe we were having a good day maybe we didn't like the person that was operating the machine maybe um we had something that we were trying to get done after work and that was the only thing on our mind and so all of that subjectivity 
is then applied to that piece of data that we're collecting or that work order that we're filling out or that assessment that we're doing, that subjectivity might be built into that data and the way we collected it. Um, so understanding that the foundation, um, the data is the foundation, helps you to understand how good that data really needs to be and objective that that data needs to be. Um, and then the last thing is don't let the complexity of advanced systems overwhelm your strategy. You've seen this a lot of times where, where an organization will buy a very complex system and then they try to force it into their current process. You need to figure out your strategy first, figure out the data you need to collect and then apply it to the systems and then they won't feel so complex because you just use what you need out of that system rather than trying to force fit um, that system into, um, into your organization. So that's it for my conversation today. I guess we're going to open it up to questions. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, uh, so we, so have, we some have some questions, questions here. here. OK. Uh, uh, first, question, first question, uh, uh, my, data my data quality, quality is really bad. bad. Help me understand Help me some understand steps to clean, clean it up. Clean it up. OK. Um, so again, first thing is go back to strategy. And I know you can't do an overall um, strategy, especially if especially if your data is is just that bad. Um, one of the worst things you can do is just go into an effort of cleaning up the data because what you're going to find out is that data is big. It's really big. Um, and then defining what is good and what's not good. What can I delete and not get myself into trouble? Like in an FDA environment, you have to be very careful about what you do with data because it's under FDA regulations and you can't change data. So what does data cleanup mean? Some of the quickest steps to do is extract the data. Just get the data out. Um, get a lot of eyes on that data. Um, start building out um, what you believe are most important steps to um, what good data looks like. And, and what we found early on is we can go through um, just a single session with their data, getting them to look at their data, and they start realizing that what the data ought to be, what a good record looks like, and then once they figure out what a good record looks like, then they can go start applying it to all of all of the rows, which could be millions of rows. Sometimes it's a you know it's an automated where you have to go out there and do it with a system. Other times it's having somebody sit down for the next couple of weeks and go clean up that data. So first steps is get everybody together, start talking about strategy, what good data looks like, and apply that then to the to the data that you have. Um, obviously, there's there's much more complex methods, but that's the fastest method. OK, uh, next, uh, next question, question we have we is have we have, have lots of data, 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 but it's in it's places in we place cannot we easily can access, access or connect to. Connect to. Is there a good way to solve this? No. <laughs> Bottom line, no. Um, and I think I think that's a um, that's a tough challenge because we're living in a in what's in theory and maybe more so in the last 60 days we're living in a connected world. And so if we have data that's disconnected uh, and I've referred to it before as we are. Connecting disconnected silos, right? So it's connected silos. Um, and I was part of that. I, I built SCADA systems for a lot of years and so I was part of building silos and so there's data often one silo and then there's another silo that's got some more really valuable data and another silo has got really really good data but I I can't get I can't get them connected but there are systems out there matter of fact I mean we're, we're building systems that are if you've heard of APIs APIs are, are, are bringing all of those silos together where I can connect to that silo and bring it back to a repository similar to a historian, but not necessarily because this what it does is it is a platform allows you to funnel data all through a single platform, which then brings all that aggregates all that data together and it allows you to send it anywhere you want. So I would encourage um, anyone to look into um, uh, platforms with AI built in that has APIs that will connect to those disconnected data sets. 
Sure. Uh, OK, so I have another question here. Uh, we are at the front end of our data journey, and you mentioned starting with small data. What are the low hanging fruits? OK, so and, and this is a conversation that can be in context with our uh, operations teams. Um, some of the low hanging fruits are, are right there in front of you. It's your system. So working on the processes within your systems, um, it goes a little bit back to our strategy. What is our data strategy? Um, and so if we can clearly define that data strategy and say these are the processes that are important to me, maybe my most critical assets, my most critical processes, um, take a close look at those, make sure that we're grabbing the data that we need from those because we all know that our most critical assets are the most critical assets for a reason. Um, they might be the one asset. If that asset goes down, the rest of the plant is down. And so take a close look at those and make sure that your data is where it ought to be there because the payback, the return on investment into that is going to pay off much quicker than let's say I've got 50 be 50 blast cabinets around around the facility or I've got um, you know 100 automated welding um, stations around the facility that are important but less critical um, because if any one of those goes down we always have a backup that we can depend on so go work on your critical assets define best practices on your critical assets and then start working across the rest of the facility for um, for things that don't have as fast to pay back, but absolutely need a good um, uh, data strategy. Does that help? Kevin, thank you. This is just awesome. Really valuable information. And I just want to make a couple of comments uh, for the audience who is listening today and the ones who will download it in, in the future or listen in the future. You know, you're hearing some common threads here between all of the lectures uh, that we've presented so far. And it goes back to what Kevin just said, making a decision on what your right strategy is and, and then applying the right techniques at the right space. and Kevin also mentioned some work with other universities. Well, guess what? We're working with them too, because you know what? We as, as teacher, teachers need to teach the same thing everywhere. There just can't be enough of us. Uh, we need to create 4 million capable workers in the future, so there couldn't be enough. Uh, Cross collaboration is absolutely important. And so I'm calling out to the community here to help pull us in where you see that going on so that we can drive these standards and make sure that we're delivering what we need to to the industry. So thank you, Kevin, for your investment as a, a senior leader, not only with us here in this lecture series, but also with the other universities and with the Connected Systems Institute, which you're going to be involved in moving forward. So uh, thank you for this um, teaser session today. Uh, I, I just also want to let everyone know that these lectures are high level introductions into workshops that we'll be featuring later this fall. Uh, so please stay tuned uh, at Connected Systems Institute. So thanks, Kevin and Charles. Take it away. And of course, I've muted. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you, Kevin, and all of our guests for your great questions and active participation. We'll be posting the recording from today's session on the CSI website events page. You can access it there shortly. I will invite you to tune in next week on May 5th when we'll hear from John Stein, the executive director of the Open Voice Network. The technologists call it conversational AI, but you know it as Alexa or Google Home or Apple Siri. Today, it answers simple questions, plays music, and perhaps entertains the kids. Tomorrow, it's perhaps the primary way we'll connect to the digital world to search the internet, operate smart factories, shop from home, and guide the self-driving car. And it will be the interface for every digital device in a world where every device is digital. Join us to explore where voice is going and how soon. 
and the issues we face with data that is both biometric and a biomarker. The coming age of voice, all you do is say yes. An hour long webinar brought to you by the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee Connected Systems Institute. Please register for this event at uwm.edu slash CSI. Thanks everyone, have a great day. Thank you.